What I was going to do, and the original plan for the talk this morning was to be about how the way we think about universal salvation affects systematic theology. Oh, how exciting. <laughs> uh, and, and how does it affect the way we think about the cross and the resurrection and so on? But I sort of spoke about that last week, and in fact, I decided that it doesn't affect it very much. That's part of the point, you know. What does it say about the creation? God created everything. It says that everyone sins. It says that Christ died for everyone, but that's what we say anyway. So in a sense, my whole argument is that part of the case for universal salvation is precisely that it's a jigsaw piece that fits in the jigsaw that we already have better than hell does. And so it doesn't do a, a whole mass of stuff to our systematic theology. So I thought, what's the point in talking about that? So instead, I thought we could talk about something more practical um, and how universal salvation might, uh, some of the more pastoral implications of that and, and about how we live and so on. And I have the wrong pair of glasses on, so I can't, it doesn't matter. Uh, I'll make do. Anyway, so I thought we'd think about, first of all, how we face evil, then how we face uh, death, then how we face the lost, and then how we face God, and, and what universal salvation means for that. Uh, so evil, something about evil. Well, evil is the biggest challenge that, uh, for faith in the goodness and love and justice of God. And evil is not a proof against God. I mean, in the past, there have been those who've tried to argue that evil demonstrates the impossibility that God could be, could be good or loving and just. And I think that not many people argue that anymore. But in spite of that, evil and suffering do constitute evidence and pretty demanding evidence against the goodness and love of God. It's a disturbing challenge for anyone who, who has faith in the God revealed in Scripture. And in the face of this, believers have often responded with what are known as theodicies. A theodicy is simply an attempt to defend the justice of God in the face of evil and suffering. And there's a whole range of theodicies. I'm not going to talk about them. All of them have some insight and something to contribute to the discussion. All of them have some weakness and problem and, and really are inadequate for the task. And there's, there's no, I always remember going to one evangelism training session. It drove me nuts. So, you know, it's like, here's a question someone might ask you. Uh, why does God allow evil? And then we were told the answer. It's, it's, it was all to do with free will and stuff like that. And it drove me crazy because it was such an obviously inadequate answer. It's not that it had nothing to say or had no value, but it was so clearly uh, flawed in numerous places that I thought if I, I would feel insulted if someone responded like that when I asked them that question as a genuine question. Uh, so I hate that kind of response. And I'm not going to give you one because I don't think universal salvation actually provides a theology or uh, solves the problem of evil. It doesn't. It's not in itself a theodicy. It does not explain why God allows evil. That everything, that all shall be well in the end, doesn't explain why God allows it not to be well en route. So there's still an issue to discuss, and I don't intend to try and solve that one. Because what universal salvation contributes principally is hope to keep going in the face of evil. And that is really important pastorally and in terms of just living life. I mean, let alone a Christian life. Living life requires that we have hope. Um, and hope helps us then with our hardships. Think of this passage from 2 Corinthians. And again, it's not universalism, but it is eschatological hope that is uh, driving Paul here. So this is 2 Corinthians 4, verses 16 to 18. So we do not lose heart, even though our outer nature is wasting away. Our inner nature is being renewed day by day. For this slight momentary affliction is preparing us for an eternal weight of glory beyond all measure. Because we look not at what we can see, but what cannot be seen. For what we see is temporary, but what cannot be seen is eternal. Now, that's not an explanation as to why God allows suffering. And Paul had his fair share of suffering. He can describe it as light and momentary affliction, not because he's laid back about some of the things he's suffered, but because of the comparison with the glory he's expecting, it is such a surpassing glory 
that it gives him the strength to carry through and keep on going in the face of suffering. And it's not to say Paul didn't have a hard time. I mean, there are times in 2 Corinthians 1, he talks about how at one point they despaired even of life itself you know, until you know, he rediscovered the, the God of comfort in the midst of that. And it's resurrection hope that brought him that. And it enables him to live in the face of suffering and evil. And this is how universal salvation has its key uh, pastoral contribution in the face of that. Now, of course, we need hope for ourselves if we're going to keep on going in the face of difficulties and sufferings and when the darkness surrounds us. But we also need hope for other people, for people we love for the communities we are a part of, and ultimately for the cosmos, because we are deeply entangled and enmeshed and relational beings. We cannot find our own fullness and satisfaction and happiness apart from the completion of and satisfaction and happiness of those around us. And this actually um, comes out a little bit in the way Uh, In Hebrews chapter 12, verse 2, when it talks about the way Jesus endured the suffering of the cross, and you'll know, I won't look it up, I know what it says, and, and you know what it says. How does Christ endure the suffering of the cross? It's for the joy set before him that he endured the suffering and the shame. Um... But the joy that was set before him wasn't just his resurrection. It's not just about his, his fate. Oh, it's going to be all right for me. That's the joy. That's not the joy that was set before Christ. He didn't have to go through the cross at all. The joy that is set before Christ is the bringing of many sons to glory. And it's the fate of the others that is what is his joy. And it's the joy of the others and the completion of the others that enables him to go through that difficulty. Now, universal salvation is, in this sense, the most expensive hope, uh, that in the end there will be no darkness, that in the end all shall be well, that in the end evil will be completely defeated. That is the sort of platinum level hope that you could possibly have uh, when facing uh, the realities of lived experience and evil. As as an aside, um, I said that universal salvation isn't a theodicy, and it isn't, but it doesn't mean that it has no role to play in a theodicy. And it could be that other theodicies could co-opt belief in universal salvation to sort of give them a boost. Um, And this, in fact, is what Origen does. Origen, I didn't say this last night for those of you who were there, but theodicy is at the heart of Origen's concern with universal salvation. And he, his actual theodicy I don't find terribly persuasive, but it is all tied in with the free will, and God isn't responsible for evil. It's down to the free choices of creatures, and, um, and, and his view of apocatastasis ties into the way that God will resolve all of this at the end. I, 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 I'm not persuaded by all of that, but I do think there's something to say about free will. Um, John Hick, who I mentioned last week, incorporates... Um, universal salvation into his soul-making theodicy so that God allows in creation uh, difficulties and sufferings because they play a a role in forming creatures. Again, I find that both helpful and disturbing, and I'm not entirely sure what I think of it, but for him, it it would be intolerable were it not for the idea that God would save all. So it could be then that universal salvation helps existing theodicies, although even then, only a bit. And I think, really, in the end, we just have to live with uh, trust in God, being prepared to trust, even though we don't understand as to why God allows evil. In fact, as an aside, actually, one of the things that actually got me towards universalism in the first place, I don't know whether I should say this, but I will, because I've never said it before, (laughs) and I hadn't realized at the time, this was in the early 90s, and I was thinking about a particular objection to belief in God. This was an objection raised by a philosopher called Anthony Flew. And he says, what things would have to happen to to count as evidence for you against the claim that God is love, that God loves someone? Would would it be that if if someone with cancer, you prayed for them and they didn't get better? Uh, Would that count as evidence that God didn't love the person? Um, Or or what, what would it be? You know, so it's a challenge, because if you can't provide anything, if if you say God loves people and that is compatible with any possible state of affairs, 
really, what are you saying? I mean, the claim seems to be rather vacuous, an empty claim, and, and you're not saying anything at all. If you're saying anything at all, you'd have to be able to specify some conditions that would not be compatible with it. But the challenge is if you provide the conditions and they happen, then you've falsified your claim. Not sure if that makes any sense. But as a teenager, that kind of really troubled me, as it does with teenagers. <laughs> so one response I felt had some mileage is that in, in principle, we ought to be able to specify the kind of things that would be incompatible with God's love, even if in practice it's difficult. Uh, in practice, because we're just creatures and there's so little we know, it might be that in this case, the person that's dying of cancer, I don't really know. There might be some reason that God allowed that that I don't know because of all sorts of factors. How could I say in practice that for sure that would disprove the claim that God loves someone? I'm not in a position to do that. But in principle, I thought, I could say that if in the end, the situation ends up that for a whole bunch of creatures, things are permanently bad. That really would be incompatible with the claim that God loves creatures and creation. The problem I had then, and that means I can specify conditions that are incompatible with God's love, so it's meaningful, even if in practice it's tricky. Problem is, of course, I thought, that's exactly what I think is going to happen. <laughs> so, ah, and that sort of got me on the road towards uh, thinking about universal salvation. More to the point, if you're going to reject universal salvation, you really have increased problems when thinking about evil. Just a few little thoughts along those lines. Um, we often think, when we talk about innocent victims of crime, we say, well, look, fortunately, we believe in a God who is just. He will call those perpetrators to account, and they're not going to get away with it. They are accountable, and God will uh, make sure that they are recompensed for what they have done. So this is supposed to be consolation. But of course, on our traditional theology, many of those victims of these crimes are not that innocent because they are sinners and they haven't believed in Christ. And so in fact, they're going to go to hell forever. And it's only a certain amount of consolation when you're burning in hell forever to know that the person who uh, tortured you or whatever is also burning in hell with you. In a sense then, God never, so we like to use the rhetoric of how God will put things right for the victims, but deep down, at least on traditional theology, it's not that. It's out of the frying pan and into the fire. It's just going to get worse for them. Um, and in fact, on traditional views, God doesn't remove evil and suffering from creation at all, but maintains it. He puts it in a box, but there it is. He keeps it on the mantelpiece, preserving it forever. And in some views of hell, um, I won't name any names, but they are there. Some evangelicals argue that God perpetuates evil and forever. So what he does is uh, he punishes someone in hell, and they really hate it. But they only deserve it. There's a finite sin they've done, so God gives them a finite punishment. But because they're so sinful, they rage against God, and so they deserve a bit more punishment, so he punishes them again. And then they rage against God, so he punishes them again. And you've got this literally vicious cycle. Uh, going on as God perpetuates rebellion in creation forever, which is a very strange view, if you ask me. I mean, what lengths we will go to to defend hell if it even completely messes up our doctrine of God, but there you go. I'd rather go with the doctrine of God. And if evil, you know, we go, well, you know, evil, maybe it's locked away and, and, and balanced with retribution and all that. But, and so God, this is Augustine's view. So although evil and sin are there, God is perfectly balancing them now with, with punishment. And so that's okay. That's a good thing. But isn't it really that sin has won then? Isn't it really the case that evil has won, that evil has stopped God bringing creation to the destiny for which he created it. Not really the kind of triumph of God I was looking forward to. It looks more like a triumph of evil. And hell itself may be its own or create its own problem of evil for God, especially if God, you know, we go, oh, well, people freely chose to go to hell. Although I don't know many people who go, yeah, I, I really want to go to hell. That's my choice. I'm going to go there. Hurrah, when they get there, this is exactly what I want. I don't imagine many people in hell think, this is what I was choosing. This is... They didn't think that's what they were choosing. If they did, they wouldn't have chosen it. But then we go, yeah, so it's their own fault. It's just free will and all that. Okay, but now God's removed their free will because he respects it so much that they have no free will to change their mind once they're there. Your fate is forever sealed. And that 
creates its own problem of disrespect for free will and uh, creates its own problem of evil. God creates the world knowing full well that many, perhaps most of his creatures, will be suffering forever. So presumably he's doing some kind of utilitarian calculation going, well, it's going to be really awful. But there's this really good stuff, and the good stuff's even better uh, because this this glory is so good that the suffering in hell, though it's terrible, is sort of outweighed. But that is an incredibly high price to pay. I just find it hard to imagine the God of the Gospels sort of sitting, making these utilitarian calculations, going, you know what? It's worth that. It's worth that eternal suffering uh, just so that I can have a few people in heaven. At least they'll be really happy because they're super happy, and their super happiness outweighs the super misery. But also, the problem is that the ha- because of what I said earlier, and our relational, we're fundamentally relational, and our happiness is connected to the happiness of other people, then um, this is a problem that the joy of the redeemed is blemished. How could I ever be completely happy in heaven if people I love are forever suffering in hell? Because my If I love them, which is presumably what God wants, right? I mean, that's what he keeps telling us in the Bible. So if I love them, I want what's best for them, and that's not what's best for them, and that will torment me forever, and presumably God. And just a quick final thought. You know, struggling in the fight against evil can be discouraging, and in the fight against oppression and injustice can be discouraging. And universalism gives us a hope and a motivation that in the end the fight against evil is not futile, even if you can't see the fruit of your labor, like in Hebrews 11, by faith, by faith. They didn't see this stuff. They didn't see the promised land, but by faith they did it because they knew the promise. And that promise is what enables us in the face of discouragement to keep going on. So a few thoughts on death. Um, Both dealing with people who are mourning and people who are facing death. Um, Giving comfort to those who are grieving over death is is quite difficult if your theology and the the theology of the person you're talking to is one that says that the dead person is almost probably, likely, very likely damned to hell forever without any hope of redemption. That does put a bit of a downer on the kind of comfort that you're able to offer. Um, How can you give reasons for hope? And and as someone who has to do funerals for people who I don't know their status, that is a live question. How can I do a funeral without having my fingers crossed behind my back? Like, I don't really mean any of the stuff that I'm saying. Especially difficult if you're talking to somebody who is um, like a Christian parent who's lost a a child, uh, who's rejected the faith and rejected the gospel. Um, What do you say to them? Because really, you know that they know the theology, right? And the theology says this this apostate is damned forever with no hope of salvation. So we go, well, you know, in the end, judgment is in the hands of God. It's not for me to say where they are. I know where they probably are, but it's not for me to say. God, (laughs) God might do something different. You know, it's always possible God might do something different from what God has said he'll do. Yeah, (laughs) or at least what I think God said he'll do. He said he'll send them to hell, but... It's God's prerogative to do something else. Okay, yes it is, but that's not a great hope for someone who's grieving. So, or we go, hey, you know what? Maybe in those last few seconds before they lost consciousness, <laughs> they repented and believed in Jesus. Yeah, that's, that's also possible. Who can say that didn't happen? But chances are it's not a whole lot to hold on to. It's like trying to hold yourself from falling off a cliff by hanging onto a blade of grass. Whereas universal salvation allows for real comfort and a real basis in the gospel for comfort for people without pretending that the person who died was necessarily ready uh, to meet with God at that point. So you don't have to say, today you will be with me in paradise. But you can offer real hope that this person's uh, destiny is one of union with God. And and in those kind of situations, I want to be able to offer pastoral hope that I think is true. If I didn't think it was true, I wouldn't do it. But I think it's true, and it doesn't have to make things easier. If, what if you're working with people who are dying? Now, the problem is, of course, if you think that death is a point of no return, then the pressure is really on. 
you have got to get this person from milk float speed to Ferrari speed in 60 seconds. And the danger of that kind of pressure is it can be abusive or it can lead you to be psychologically manipulative. Uh, and it can also be counterproductive because people are often not, simply not able to move that far that fast in that amount of time. And so it can be, it's pastorally um, a very tricky and problematic frame of mind to go into that kind of situation with. So the way I, for me, universal salvation helps is that I th it takes off some of that pressure. It removes a point of no return view of death. And that means, the way I think of it, is that my job is to help this person move closer towards God. So that I begin wherever they're at. And I think, and I have the freedom then to try and discern what the Spirit's doing and where the Spirit's working and move as best I can judge it at the speed of the Spirit as they're working in the life of this person and help that person move further, closer towards God. Um, without feeling the pressure that I have to get them all the way to some kind of to baptism or you know saying the prayer or whatever it is we do, uh, I I haven't failed if I can't get them all the way to that. Um, so it's the freedom to be discerning and a bit more sensitive to people. And in some contexts, I, I work in a hospice context uh, sometimes, and they're very clear that if you try and uh, pressure people into converting, uh, you're going to be out and you're not going to work here. So you won't be able to minister to any of these people. So that's not going to help anyone. Uh, so in some contexts, it's not even an option. You can't do that. You can sort of guide people at their own speed, but you have to be listening and paying attention to what God's doing in their life. So I think universalism does have helpful things to say about uh, how we deal with people facing death or grieving the death of loved ones. Does that make sense? Okay. Um, facing the lost. So here is some things that we would believe, and you know, there's lots of very positive things that any Christian theology would say about this. So this is not unique to universal salvation, but it might sort of help a little bit with it. Universal salvation sees every person as created by God for theosis or for union with God, uh, unwaveringly loved by God, a sinner into salvation, someone for whom Christ died and rose again, someone whom God has saved or is saving or will save through Christ. So I have this quote from uh, Peter Sterry, who's just this, he's this, um, he was one of Oliver Cromwell's chaplains, a, a very educative and erudite man, uh, a Calvinist, universalist, and just a beautiful bloke. And this is one of the things he says. All men are redeemed by the same blood of the Lord Jesus who has given himself as a ransom for all to be testified in the proper times. Is this Terry? Yes, it is. <laughs> Each person which hath his part in this ransom hath its proper time for its discovery in him. <coughs> Thine may be now sooner. This person also, now most of all lost in the depths of all evils, may have his proper time yet to come for the taking off of the disguise of these filthy rags from him for the discovery of the glory as the Son of God in him. What he's saying here is, it might be that God's drawing you sooner than someone else, but Christ died for all of them. So he says, and this is the bit, so look thou on every man as a brother to thee. And so this, this, and this is what he did. I mean, Sterry really exemplifies this. He treats even people who are his enemies as people who are, in some sense, brothers, and he treats them with gentleness and kindness. And so I just wonder, I think, this affects how we see other people and how we engage other people. Because nobody is rejected by God. Nobody is rejected by God. Of course, God rejects the sin in us, but God doesn't reject the sinner. God rejects the Adamic self, we might say, to be theological. Uh, but God doesn't reject us. So how would it affect the way we think about people that we might see as a threat to us? to see them as future sisters and brothers, people created, loved, redeemed by God. It doesn't necessarily make them our friends, but it does mean that you shouldn't reject or dismiss other people. How much time have I got? Lots. <laughs> a bit more precisely? 
Oh, gosh. Well, now. <laughs> That's loads of time. We'll have time for questions. Facing the lost. So it's often said, and I mentioned this last time, that universal salvation undermines, undermines evangelism or pro proclamation of the good news of Jesus. And the, the logic behind that is quite straightforward. If everyone's going to be saved, why bother preaching the gospel to them? You could just as easily sit back and watch Doctor Who. And uh, that is a good way to spend one's time. But here's the thing, and I did mention this last week. Universalists believe that God saves people through the gospel and through the proclamation of the gospel. So how is it? It does seem a little bit strange to suggest that believing that God will save all people through the gospel is a reason not to proclaim the gospel. And that seems a bit of a strange logic. And Calvinists, who often make this objection, uh, should know better because they have an exactly analogous situation. A Calvinist says God will redeem all of those he's elected to salvation. So God elects some people to salvation from eternity and not others in Calvinism. So God chooses, I will save these people. And the people that God chooses, that God will save, will be saved. But God saves these people through the preaching of the gospel. So Calvinists go out and preach the gospel so that the elect will be saved. Um, but you could say, and many Arminians have said, well, Calvinism undermines the preaching of the gospel, because if all the elect will be saved, why not sit at home and watch Doctor Who? Actually, it's Star Trek, because Arminians have no sense of taste. <laughs> <laughs> um, but of course, Calvinists, some of our best gospel preachers, past and present, have been Calvinists, because they believe it's precisely through the proclamation of the gospel that God saves the elect. And so, too, uh, with, with universalists, they believe it is precisely through the proclamation of the gospel that God uh, redeems and or enables people to share in the salvation that he's brought about in Christ. So it doesn't seem, the logic seems to sort of unravel when you think about it. And indeed, universal salvation is and has been historically a motivator for evangelism. Um, I mentioned a few folk last week who were Universalists, you can read all about them in the new book I wrote on universal salvation from the Reformation to the 19th century. Anyway, among, in, among the characters in that book, there's George de Benville, who, um, when he, through a vision, uh, becomes convinced of universal salvation, he goes across to continental Europe and he just goes around preaching about Jesus everywhere. He doesn't think, hey, I'll just sit back and you know, shoot the breeze. He couldn't have watched Doctor Who because he didn't make it till 1963, but he would have watched the equivalent Star Wars. I think. Um, or Elhanan Winchester, who I mentioned also last week. He was a Baptist revivalist preacher in the evangelical revival. He uh, went around preaching everywhere. He saw lots of people become Christians, and he spoke very passionately about the importance. On the death when John Wesley died, he loved John Wesley. And, when, and in fact, he was a minister just down the road from Wesley's chapel in London. So he was American, but he, he was a minister in America and in London. So he spoke about the importance of the evangelist and the need to preach the gospel and how important that was. So somebody forgot to tell him that being a universalist meant he shouldn't do that. Or we think of Peter Berler and uh, Count von Zinzendorf, who were pioneers in the Moravian missions movement, which transformed the face of missions. Uh, these were kind of key movers behind that. Uh, both of them were universalists. Not many people know that. And yet somehow, again, they forgot to realize that thinking that God will save everyone doesn't mean that we don't have to tell the gospel to them. Um, in fact, what universal salvation does is it gives us an inspiring vision of the future and an invitation from God to participate in what God's doing in the world for the redemption of creation. And that's actually quite an inspiring motivation to be involved with it. Um, I think about what Paul says in 2 Corinthians uh, 5, where he says, um, all this is from God, who's reconciled us to himself through Christ and has given us the ministry of reconciliation. That is, in Christ, God was reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and entrusting the message of reconciliation to us. So we are ambassadors for Christ. So here's God on this great mission of reconciling the world to himself. 
And here's Paul saying, and God has co-opted us as co-workers in this mission of redemption of creation. And that's what we are. We proclaim the reconciliation that God has uh, achieved and we say to people, and so he says, I urge you, be reconciled to God. So he's inviting them to participate in this reconciliation that God has done. And that's an inspiring motivation for him to engage in mission and evangelism. It's being part of his cosmic purpose. Um, it certainly didn't seem to put him off doing it, participating in God's mission of reconciliation. And what are you saying about God anyway? If you think the only reason somebody would want to believe in God is for fear of hell, you're obviously, it's obviously a vote of no confidence in God's beauty and love and the attractiveness of it. Also, as far as mission goes, is... Um, oh, yeah, I'll say this as well. Well, just before I say this, um, it stops... It's easy to lose heart in mission sometimes. It feels like, and there are many mission stories that would testify to this kind of thing. You're sowing and sowing and there's no reaping, you know, and it's really disheartening. The thought that in the end all will be saved is a thought that it's not in vain. Our labor in the Lord is not in vain. And it's the hope, and that's the theme that runs through all of this. What universal salvation gives is hope in the face of these situations. And it's hope that enables us to keep on going uh, when everything else would say, give up. Um, and what it also does, and finally on mission, uh, evangelism and mission, is um, it avoids the paralysis of making the salvation of the lost. I mean, you might not be comfortable with that language, so convert it into whether, whatever language you're comfortable with, but our responsibility. And this, this goes back to, again, as a teenager, I was reading a tract by Amy Carmichael, and in the tract, she tells this vision she has, and it's the cliff, and there's thousands and thousands of people heading towards the edge of the cliff, and they're dropping off forever into eternal doom. And there's her, and just like a scattering of people who are like saying, don't go over the cliff, don't go over the cliff. And so that's the job of the missions. It's, our job. it's your responsibility to warn them. They're going to eternal damnation. If you don't, their blood will be on your heads. Um, and, I, and this was like simultaneously motivating and absolutely paralyzing. I thought that I, I just, I was crushed under the impossible responsibility of being single-handedly responsible for the salvation of the world, it felt like. And, in, and it didn't motivate me to do mission, uh, not at all. It motivated me to uh, bury my head in the sand and pretend that, that, that this wasn't happening. Uh, universal salvation uh, provides a motivation for mission that removes some of that paralysis. And finally, facing God. So universal salvation uh, relieves, of, relieves us of the suspicion of darkness in God. And you may have lived with this. I've talked to lots of people who have uh, lived with this. The suspicion that really, although we say God loves everyone, he doesn't actually. Or the suspicion that although we say, we might say God wants to save everyone, it's particularly acute if you're a Calvinist, because you might find nice ways of trying to make it sound good, but really you know that in fact God doesn't want to save everyone. When I was a Calvinist, I found this excruciatingly difficult. Um, the suspicion that maybe God uses people as a means to an end. Um, so on some theologies, God punishes people forever to reveal the glory of his justice, because this is a just, it's a perfectly just punishment. This is a good thing. It's, it is pure justice exemplified for the cosmos to see. Um, but it's, and, and so on some of these, God creates people specifically so that they can be sin and be punished and he can show his glory. And in a sense, then, it's hard not to think that God's using people's de destinies and fates and sufferings as a means to his own glory, which is a hard thing to live with. They are, these things are a psychological weight that chew away at us. And they feel like uh, I was out in the desert with Mark the other day, and there's all these sandstone things where the cliff's been cut under, underneath. And it goes so far, and then the whole lot comes down. Uh, and it's a bit like that. All of these things gnaw away underneath until there's nothing holding up your desperate attempts to hold on to God and the whole thing comes crashing down. 
More than that, in trying to defend these kind of views, we feel that we are sometimes engaged in spiritual deformation. Instead of becoming more Christ-like, we're actually trying to make ourselves the opposite. So I was having a conversation online with a chap who was, he didn't like me, and that's okay. Um, but he was boasting in how godly he was because he was able to rejoice in the sufferings of the damned, including some of his relatives, and this made him positively happy. And I found this really disturbing, because I thought, how, that is not a godly attitude. I mean, that's not the way God you know, thinks about the death of a sinner. God takes no delight in the death of a sinner, says Ezekiel. Oh, well, apparently he does. And uh, this guy thinks that he has to, so what do you have to do to yourself psychologically to make yourself happy at the thought of that? Um, so instead of spiritual formation and becoming more like Christ, you're actively, by trying to defend this destiny and this future, you're actively making yourself more ungodly. And that's concerning to me. Universal salvation brings us an assurance before God Perfect love casts out all fear. It's not that there is no place for fear, but I think it frames the way we think about fear. Here's how I think about it. We can fear falling in grace, but we don't fear falling from grace. So we can fear falling in the hands of God, but not falling from the hands of God. Because in the end, my salvation doesn't depend upon me. Of course, I have to cooperate, but in the end, it is guaranteed by God. That is such a relief. Because in the end, it's not about how hard and how well can I hold on to God. It's about how well God can hold on to us. And God is really good at holding on to us. And even, you know, lost sheep to go away, God is really good at looking for lost sheep. And he keeps on doing it until he finds them. So that gives us an assurance. It's a place in which we can grow in love for God without constantly fearing that somehow we might do something that's going to mess the whole thing up. And, and screw up our salvation. And it also motivates the pursuit of holiness. Why should we bother being holy? And this is, a, we, last night we talked about this. Uh, it's often said universalism means no one's going to bother being holy. But actually, that's not necessarily true. Uh, Hannon Winchester was really impressed by, he lived in Philadelphia, just north of Philadelphia, is a little town called Germantown. And there were lots of pietists, German pietists, who'd moved there. And many of them were universalists, and he was so impressed by their piety. That was one of the things that drew him uh, to universalism, was just how pious these people were. And as we heard last night from Ilaria, uh, many of the early church fathers who argued for universal salvation were deeply holy people, very concerned with the pursuit of holiness. So obviously, nobody bothered to explain to them that they didn't have to worry about that. But you see, it's because partly we don't get it because Protestants have this kind of over-focus on the forensic justification and forgiveness, which are important, but it's all about that. Salvation is about some technical legality that God can do through the cross to enable us to be let into heaven uh, and, and let off being punished for our sins. That's what salvation is. But they had a much more holistic view of salvation, and they thought becoming transformed to be like Christ is what salvation is, right? We talk about sanctification as if it's something that happens after salvation, but sanctification is, is salvation. It's working out our salvation, and that's their framework. So thinking that you're going to be saved and everyone will be saved is about, is about sanctification. It's about pursuing God and becoming more like God. Um, and anyway, our motivation for holiness, we, we, we were talking about, I was talking to Alex's dad last night, who's somewhere, somewhere, uh, about this, and this is a really good thought from him, so I take no credit for this. Our motivation for holiness, a real, the kind of motivation God's looking for from us is love for God, love for the good, pursuing good because it's good, not pursuing good because we're scared of what being punished in hell. You know, if the only reason we're doing good is so that we don't get punished in hell, that's not really... That's not really a sanctified motivation for doing good. It, it's not that there's no place for that. There might be a place for that. Uh, but it's really second best. You want to get beyond that pretty fast. You want to get drawn by the love of God. And that is what sanctification is about. And that's what universal salvation has to say. Okay, so that's that. 
Uh, universal salvation gives us hope for transformation in spite of the gap between where we are and where we should be. You, like me, have probably faced this. It's like, man, I've been a Christian for this many years and I'm still a complete whatever, words I can't say. Um, you know, how, why, why am I still struggling with this issue and so on? Um, well, those are good questions to ask and it's, and it's worth not being complacent about them. But universal salvation gives us hope because it basically says, the one who began a good work in you will bring it to completion on the day of Jesus Christ. So in a sense, we're saying, okay, it's that hope again. It's hope for change, hope for transformation, because that is grounded in God and not ultimately in us. And finally, uh, ending where it all began for me, universal restoration um, inspires love for God and worship of God. Um, and my story is, if you've read The Evangelical Universalist, you'll know, began with this, what I call a doxological crisis, a crisis in worship, where I was in worship one day and I was thinking, you know, God could save all people without violating their freedom. I'd come to believe that. Um, but I didn't think he would. And so I thought God could save all these people I love uh, without going against their free will and he's not going to do it. He might save some of them, but... And I couldn't, I thought, how can I worship God? How can God be good? How can, and it actually, you know, I just thought I had to stop. And I thought, I can't worship God. I couldn't let go of God because I am a stubborn git. Is that a word that you're allowed to say? Edit it out if it's not. Um, I'm a stubborn burp. Uh, I'm not going to let go of God because I, I, I trust God enough deep down to know that even though I don't understand things, it'll pan out and it'll make sense. But, uh, you know, it was a struggle. And universal salvation, so looking into universal salvation was like such a relief when I, I thought, wow, God's amazing. I mean, God is, the cross is so powerful and God's love is so deep and God's power is so great. I, wow, I mean, this makes you want to worship. And all creation, you know, this, you want to, is it really worth the stuff we do? What's the point in working for creation? God's going to burn it all up, but God's purpose is a cosmic and God's going to beatify the whole cosmic order. Wow, well, that's amazing. That's, you know, and it kind of makes you want to worship. Uh, and all the nations will worship God. And so then I, then I think, wow, so when we're worshiping at church, this is like a prophetic anticipation of the new creation. So here we are worshiping God, not instead of all those heathen out there, but I'm worshiping God on behalf of them because they're going to be worshiping God too one day. And so I'm just like a little prophetic sign of the age to come by worshiping. Uh, with all these people, these different people from all over the world, we're worshiping God, uh, one family, one in Christ, and one day that will be the case when God is all in all. So these, uh, this is then a vision about a God who is love and a God whose love wins, and this magnifies God. It inspires worship. It's a worship that has no shadows. Um, it's not about bowing down before raw power, but a power that is, in essence, the power of beauty, truth, and goodness. And this is in the end, why I am a Christian universalist.